book of Genesis once again. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. I want to uh, finish up the message that we started last week. Um, and it's, directly, it's directed mostly to the men in our church. Um, and it's entitled, The Legacy of a Good Father. The Legacy of a Good Father. And we're learning about an individual in the Bible by the name of Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we read about that. Genesis chapter 6, I said, uh, I believe I said 6. Look at verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth. And behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way on the earth and God said unto Noah the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold I will destroy them with the earth let's pray Father Lord help us to really learn of you today and we are so recognizing that you are the Lord of creation. But we're not here to lift up denomination, our preferences, ourselves most certainly. We're only here to lift up the name of Jesus. We're here to worship you. Which means we're here to ascribe you value and worth that you deserve. And Lord, with your worth and with your value, there's so much for us to learn from the richness of your word. So God, help us to do that today. Pray that for this message that others would not tune it out just because they may not be a grandfather, they may not be a man, they may not be a husband or, or father themselves. Pray that, we'll, that we will see the truth in the scriptures and from this text we will identify the marks that the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor. He benefited from his relationship with you. There was blessings that came to him from you. This was not a perfect man. We know of that God. There are no perfect people here today, not the one who is speaking now and not the ones who are listening. So, Lord, we just come as imperfect people to a perfect God, recognizing that it is you that brings change, that it is, you, it is only you that brings forgiveness, it is only you that brings salvation, and it's only you that brings us hope. And so, Lord, may we live as the Bible instructs. And so, Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. And, Lord, we ask that you bless the message. May I clearly communicate your word. And may every ear listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yesterday we had a training here. Um, there was a safety, um, church safety and precaution a day yesterday 
and uh, that was well attended and but that did not happen with a lot of without a lot of help we had other churches come and represent their church uh, looking and interested in the training Um, Henry County Sheriff's Office came in and uh, we partnered with them and they came in and helped us with that and and so many of you were behind the scenes and uh, I got a list yesterday I asked for who volunteered and I got a list of those individuals yesterday and and I would be amiss to uh, read or by memory mention every name but I want to personally thank you as your pastor Uh, how you represented Christ well. You served Him well. And you represented this church well. And uh, so thank you for doing that because I do see that as a ministry. We have the buildings. We have the uh, avenue. We have the resources to help. And uh, and so thank you for helping other churches get help. Thank you for that. And uh, and so thank you for all that helped and were serving. And uh, Taylor, thank you for leading that and heading that up as you do our prevention team here Uh, that makes a difference so thank you for you that sacrificed your time in coming to learn and grow uh, yesterday today when we speak of Noah though we speak of him and when you think of Noah you think of ark you can't think of Noah without thinking of a big ship Uh, some of you just got back some of you've taken trips this year and you've gone to um, find the ark and you found it Of course, it wasn't the original ark. It was man-made ark. But you went, and some of you were so kind to send me pictures and remind me how I'm missing out and how good of a time you're having. And I appreciate that. I want to go so bad and uh, and take our family there. I think it's historic. And uh, I just want to say to you, though, and I think every believer would identify with this today, If we never found the ark or we never saw a replica made of the ark, we still believe in the big ark. Amen? Because God said it. We take this Bible literally. However, it's something amazing um, when even I see pictures of some of you folks standing at the bottom of the ship and you look about this big compared to this ship. And it was. It was four football lengths. And when you think of Noah, you think of that, but you don't think of him as being the one that we would talk of about leaving a good legacy as a father. Because at the end of Noah's life, at the latter end of it, after the ark found dry land and after God removed all of that and started over with the next generations, here's what we find on Noah's resume. We find him drunk and we find him naked with his children. So with the poor judgment and with the sinful decisions, you may not think that this guy should be the epitome or, or uh, the picture of someone that we should be talking about having a legacy as a good father. But here's the thing. The text speaks differently of Noah because if you know your Bible and you've read it at all, If you know any of the stories of the Bible, this book, other than one, this book, other than one, and his name is Jesus, outside of Jesus, this book is full of people with imperfections. This book is full of sinful people that God used for his glory. This book is filled of people with mistakes in their life. People, you find murderers in this book. Uh, You find adulterers in this book. You find prostitutes in this book. You find uh, uh, a sodomy in this book. You find those who laid with their own kind. You find homosexuality in this book. You find all sorts of blemishes in this book outside of Jesus Christ. But this is the book that God gave us. And this is the book that God gave us to instruct us how to live the Christian life. And so on these pages, while you find imperfect people, I want to remind you that every church building today is filled with imperfect people, including the one that's giving them the message today. But on every page of this book, you also find a perfect Savior. So may I say to you, you'll find what you're looking for if you're looking in the right place. 
You'll find you on these pages if you choose to. But even in all of this, the Bible says, as James said, that this book is a mirror. And this book is a reflection of who I am. But it's also a reflection of who I can be in Christ. So there's hope in this book. And that's why we look to this book and we look to Noah today because I want to remind you with all the problems that Noah had, and he had some, Noah's greatest success as a father was the fact that he saw every member of his family saved. And there's no greater accomplishment, I believe, for a man, for a husband, for a father, obviously, to see every member of his family saved. I want to remind you that while everyone has things in their past, how many of you have something in your past you'd like to get erased right now? Amen? Yes. How many of you like to go ahead and put two hands up, all right? I, I got two hands up. Can I, can I dig a little deeper with you? How many have something even from last week you'd like to get erased? Amen. Yes, we all do. Say, Pastor, I don't know. Well, then you just probably had a lot of pride just now, so you can go ahead and try to get that one erased. Because whether you did it indeed, you may have thought about it. See, we all stand here with the past. We all sit here with the past. And it's easy for us, because this book was, book was written so long ago, it's easy for us to look from the outside in and go, you know what, man, they're kind of just a bunch of mess-ups. And we kind of lose the sensitivity to this. And we kind of get ourselves a little distant from this book and fail to realize that we are just like this. And we fail to identify that this book was written for us. This book wasn't written for God. This book was written for us. And all of us have a past. All of us have a past that we're not proud of. We've made sinful choices, every one of us. And I'm sure at times, you've brought hurt in your own life. And maybe, just possible, you've even brought hurt in the lives of others. So even if you haven't brought hurt today in the lives of others, you've been hurt by the lives of others. But I want to remind you today, as this book helps us to remember, because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Here's a man who had some blunders on his portfolio. But the Bible goes on record and says that Noah walked with God. And I want to remind you that your past does not have to define who you are unless you let it. So if you want to walk around with the identity of a shameful and regretful past, then you go ahead and do it. But that is not the Christ life for you. That is not the life that Christ has for you. And I want to remind you of something I've said for years. The past is a great place to reflect, but it's a horrible place to live. And while you cannot change the past, you sure can change the meaning of it. So all of this depends on how you choose to live your life. If you want to choose your life looking in the rearview mirror, you go right ahead, brother. You go right ahead, sister, but you won't get very far. You won't get very far. And this book is not so you can live in the past. This book is to remind you of your past and how much you need to recognize that you don't have a future without Jesus Christ. And He is the only one who can change your past into a good and bright and hopeful future. Only Jesus. Now whether you're a father or not, grandparent or not, there's something for all of us to learn. And last time we understand that the gift that we can give our kids, the gift that we can give children is to know Jesus, to love God, and to love His Word. That's the greatest gift any parent can give. Now I don't know what your background is. I don't know where you've come from. Not all of you. But I do know this, the best parents, the greatest parents, don't push you away from church. They push you 
into church. Uh, they don't talk negative about God, even if they don't know anything about God. They don't talk negative about it. If anything, they realize in their heart and in their true conscience that He is a holy and just God. And there is a fear and an honor of God. And baby, we don't talk and take God's name in vain in this home. Or oh, we may not go to church like we should, but we still reverence God for who He is. Why? Because I remember what Grandpa used to say. I remember what Grandma used to say. And we may have derailed a little bit. We may have taken a different path. But we still believe that God is God and He's God alone. And a good parent, a great parent, a parent who desires to leave a legacy for their child is not interested in how much stuff they can buy for their children. They're not trying to buy their children's love. They're not trying to buy their child's affection. Instead, they just want to give them Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about you shoving God down their throat. I'm not talking about that you just bombard them to where it's kind of hateful and mindful. That's not the God of this book. That's Jesus wrapped in your mentality. But I do understand this. The mistakes that children are going to make and the sinful choices that they will make should not directly be contributed to the fact that they were not brought to church. So can you remember that today? So for some of you grandparents that wish your babies and your grandbabies would get back in church, the best thing you can do is number one, keep praying, and number two, don't stop asking them and telling them to come to church. Now, I know grandparents spoil their grandbabies. But I know Paul also said that there be many that spoil you and lead you away from the gospel. That there be many that will entice you by men's traditions and the rudiments of the world. There be many that spoil you. That word spoil literally means to corrupt. Now grandma, grandparent, granddad, don't corrupt that little baby. You get him in church. Well, my son and daughter don't want to bring them. Well, you go right by and pick them up. If they want to stay in the bed, you let them stay in the bed. But you get some toothbrush, uh, toothpaste in that baby's mouth, that kid's mouth, and you shove it in there, give them some dentine, put some uh, pants on them, clothes on them, you bring them on to church. And say, I'll bring them back when I'm done with them. But you get them in church. Why? Because someone has to pass the faith along. As the Bible says, that was once delivered unto the saints. Folks, if you stop being the church, there is no church tomorrow. So don't make the mistake that church is just easy peasy. We can come when we want to. Don't have to. Might. I don't know. I, I, I just may get out. May not. I don't know. Sure. My friend, you can't afford to get out of church. You can just watch the news and realize many people have gotten out of church. And our children, we know, are going to do some silly things and foolish things because foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The Bible says in Proverbs twenty two fifteen 15 that the rod of correction will drive it far from them. You know they're going to make mistakes just like you. But also know that there were some mistakes that were being made here in the Bible. And the Bible lets us know that when God saw the wickedness on the earth, He said that the earth continually thought evil, that they were doing evil continuously. Now I'm going to tell you something. God is not passive. When God sees something that is wrong, and when He hears something that is wrong, He don't take a seat and just go, well, I just hope this thing goes away. That's not what God does. When God sees wrong, when God hears wrong, you know what He does? He speaks out about it. And He gives action towards it. And He is pronouncing judgment. And whenever judgment is coming, there is something that always happens in the mind and in the heart of God. First, there's always a warning. God never, listen to me now, 
For some of you that are on the fence about your salvation and you think God is a hating God and a judging God and He is not loving and all of that, I want you to know He's both. But before He ever will pour out judgment, you listen to me now, He will always give you warning first to let you know, if you get right with God, I'll withhold the punishment. If you get right with me, I'll withhold the punishment. Never does God just sneak up and render the judgment and punishment. Ha ha, gotcha! He's not that kind of God. Every time in Scripture, are you with me now? Stay with me. This is an important principle to know. Because even in His judgment, He is full of kindness and grace. He's full of love and mercy. Why? How can you know? Because He's always telling you, and He's always warning you before it comes. And as a father and a mother, as a parent, a grandparent, when you see something in your child that is not right, you see something in your child that is crooked, it ought to grieve you. The Bible says it grieved the Lord. Literally, the Bible says that God repented. We know that God doesn't repent as you would associate that word with sin. That is not what it means. The word repent means to change one's mind. God changed his mind on the subject and decided, you know what, this type of system, the direction that they're going, I will not let them go that direction any longer. I'm going to stop that and we're going to start over. The Bible says when it says repented, it literally means that when God grieved in his heart, the Bible literally gives the word that God sighed. There was a big exhale. There was a big moment in God's heart where he literally had a breath, and it was like, oh, no. Not that he was caught off guard, but that it hurt his heart deeply. And because of mankind's sinful decisions, God would now have to produce and pronounce judgment. But according to Scriptures, there is one man and one family who found favor in the Lord. Have you found favor in the Lord? Have you found grace in the Lord? Not without Him you haven't. So if you want, listen men, if you want to leave a legacy, there's a certain way that you need to do that according to the Scriptures. So how can men have a legacy of being a good father like Noah? Well, number one, we learned that Noah walked with God. Look at verse 9 again. Look at the very end. What does it say? And Noah walked with God. Let's say that together. Noah walked with God. Ready, begin. Noah walked with God. That's right. He did. He did. What does that mean? Well, what it means is that we find that Noah was a converted man. He was a consecrated man. And he was a consistent man. The Bible says that he was just and perfect. He literally was just, justified. He did what was right and perfect. That word perfect doesn't mean he didn't have a flaw. Obviously, we know he had a flaw. It means he was mature. He walked with God. And this is the testimony that he had. And he lived consistent. What about you? Do you live consistent in your Christian life? What I find, most Christians, the most consistent thing about them is their inconsistency. But the Bible lets us know that he was consistent. He was straightforward. What does that mean for us? Living consistent as a Christian means that whatever you do on Sunday is what you're going to be found doing on Monday or any other day of the week because you are not somebody different on Sunday than you are on any other day of the week. You know there's a word for that person. You do know that, right? Starts with an H. Ends with an E. has a Poe in the middle of it? Can you finish this? The, can you fill out the blanks? Can you fill that word in for me? What, what's that word? All of us in here have been that person, have we not? What happened? How did I get that way? I stopped being consistent. 
I made my own choice. I made my own decision. Ah, that was the problem. But Noah was a man who walked with God. I want to remind you of something. There are only two men in the entire Bible that have this kind of testimony. The specific testimony of men who walked with God. Those men were Noah and Enoch. The Bible says that Enoch's testimony was so strong that while he was out walking with God one day, while they were just fellowshipping together, the Bible says that God just took him up to heaven to be with him. How sweet was that? Where'd he go? Did, I thought Enoch was out here. Yeah, I just saw well, I just saw it. He's gone. How sweet was that? God said, that was so awesome with you, you want to come with me. No other person has that recorded about them. It blows my mind. I can't even preach on Enoch. There's nothing talked about Enoch except he walked with God and God took him. Enough said, that's the message. Right? That's the message. Noah walked with God. That's what I want to happen to me. I want to walk so closely with God that it's when my time to go that I'm not struggling with my beliefs. <laughs> I'm not struggling with my convictions. I'm not struggling with God. I'm not struggling with sin. I'm not even struggling to stay on this earth. But God just takes me. That's how I want to go. Now, I don't get a choice about that. But I do get a choice of how I live my life prior to that. And so do you. Here's what I want to challenge you with. May the desired legacy be for all dads, husbands, and men today that they will be remembered as a man who walked with God. Did you hear me today, men? May that be your legacy. Be that man. Be that man. You don't be a man's man. You become God's man. You be known as the man, a man, who walked with God. So we find Noah was a man who walked with God. But let me tell you a second thing about Noah today. Noah witnessed to others. Noah witnessed to others. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you don't have to turn there. The Bible goes on record. And the Bible says this about Noah. It says that Noah, I love this, that he was a preacher of righteousness. <laughs> the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. While he was building the ark, though, he was telling the world about what was to come. What was that? Judgment? While he was building the ark, he was not only telling them what was to come, he was also telling them a way to escape. You know what the way was to escape? You know what that was? Get in the boat. It's the same message that we give you and we give the world today. Judgment is coming. Romans 2 says that every man is storing up wrath against the day of wrath. And God is going to pour out His judgment, His righteous indignation. He's going to pour out His righteous judgment on all those who have an, an unrepentant, an impenitent heart. Those who do not turn to God. The Bible says that God is going to pour out His judgment on those individuals one day. That judgment is not here. So that judgment is to come. So what are we doing? We're warning those individuals judgment is coming what do we tell them how to get out of it get in 
the boat. See, Pastor, we don't have a boat. Except the one I put on Smith Mountain Lake or Goose Point. Is that the boat? No. The ark is a typology. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. You got to get in Christ. Or you will not avoid the judgment that's to come. Are you hearing me today? Are you with me now? This is a beautiful, beautiful story. But Noah witnessed to others. For 120 years... Noah preached the same message. For 120 years, he preached the same sermon. It was the same message day in, day out, week after week, year after year, for 120 years. Don't tell me you're bored here. 120 years. That old geezer said the same thing. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. What'd you say today, Noah? Get in the boat. I heard that. What's tomorrow? What's on the agenda tomorrow? Get in the boat. That's what he did for 120 years. But here's what you have forgotten. For 120 years, he had no converts. A hundred and twenty years. Same thing. For 120 years, nobody joined the church. For 120 years, no one came to the service. For 120 years, no one gave to the work. For 120 years, no one got saved but Noah and his family. Every day, every week, every year, only eight people showed up to hear the message. Get in the boat! It's easy to get discouraged. I'd have to think with a few splinters in Noah's hand, a little bit of pitch in, pitch out, and that black stuff and that tar stuff all over. Man, this will not come out of my cloak. Get this out of my, my cloak, woman. He didn't say that. I made that up. Can you imagine that? Blister after blister, plank after plank. The bigger it got, the less people came interested. For 120 years, it's the same thing, and no one cared. I would imagine Noah got discouraged. So I want to remind you today. Don't get, discouraged. Don't get discouraged when you keep inviting people to church and they won't show up. After 120 years, maybe you can start to get discouraged, but until then, keep on inviting. Don't get discouraged when people are in and out of church and it looks like there's a revolving door. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged when those that you were investing in and those that you were trying to help suddenly just quit on you and they stop coming to church without any warning. Just quit. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged when, when nobody in the church is shouting but you. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. When nobody in the church seems like they're singing, but you, you keep singing. Don't get discouraged when it seems that nobody wants to be here, but you. Noah preached for 120 years with no results. At least it seems that way. And on the surface, it seems 
hopeless and most definitely discouraging. But I want to remind you of something that I've reminded myself of these last few weeks in giving this message. Are you ready? Pay attention. Pay attention. I want to remind you that you're not responsible for the results. You're only responsible for telling your story that God has given you to tell. You are not responsible for the results. And neither am I. So stop putting them on me. And I'll stop putting them on you. We're not responsible for that. But you are responsible for telling your story. And when you haven't done that, then there is no wonder why there are no results. See, what you might not know is that Noah witnessed to others, but he did it through Noah witnessing through his conduct. We just read in the text, and it said that every imagination was only evil continually. That means it was constant and did not change. And folks, doesn't it feel like to you, maybe you live under a rock, maybe you live with your head in the sand, I'm not sure, but doesn't it feel like you that to you that we live in a society where this is the same I'll I'll be honest with you things have not changed except for believers we live in a society where every imagination is evil continually and even in church today hang in there because this is about to get real for you Or something that is called sin in the Bible. It's not called sin anymore. It seems that we've done a lot of rewording. And a lot of redefining. As we're trying to substitute for the real thing in the Bible. We do that with a lot of translations. We've done that with a lot of denominations. We've done that with a lot of what's on the agenda for music. We've done that with a lot of what color or length is the hair and and what is the person wearing. And and, and we get caught up in all the things that really are a substitute for what's at hand. And that is, are people getting in the boat? It's like the church version of sweet and low. It's like saccharin. While it may taste sweet, and while it is palatable nonetheless, and while it may also take the bitterness out of whatever you are eating or drinking, the truth of the matter is it does more harm than it does good. So while on the outside it seems sweet, and it seems like it has uh, uh, even something that tingles the taste bud, Paul said that we will have teachers having each itching ears where they will no longer want to hear the unadulterated truth of the Bible. They only want to be told what is sweet. But while we are taking that in, we're killing ourselves from the inside out. And what we've done is we've made a pure imitation of the real thing. And the word imitation only means, when you define it, a mockery. We've made a mockery of what church is supposed to be. Church is supposed to be where sinners get right with God. Take your preferences and all your politics and leave them outside. This is a place 
where people who've got junk in their closet, they've got sin in their attic, they've got things that they've been hiding for years, that they've been lying about, that they've been suppressing about, that they've been hiding, that they've been absolutely manipulating, they've been committing adultery on everyone and God, they've been blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and yet they come to church and play the religious game. My friend, that is nothing but a cheap imitation for the real holy God. Adultery is no longer that. It's now called an affair. Drunkenness is now a disease. Marijuana is now used for medicinal reasons. And our own state is trying to pass it to where no no longer is it illegal homosexuality is now an alternative lifestyle and abortion is now planned parenthood you can't be a parent idiot without having a baby it's ludicrous it's insane It's a mockery. And the church has failed to witness in its conduct how we live. The modern church has bought into the ecumenical movement to become church light. L-I-T-E. We give Bible light. L-I-T-E. We preach a sermon light. L-I-T-E. Because we don't want to offend anyone. Fasten up now. Dear friend, I'd rather you be offended by the truth and miss hell than for you to become a part of the social gospel crowd where anything goes. Where everything is accepted. Hold on now. I'm not through with all the words yet. Where everything is tolerated. I have a 10 page report I've put together on one word called tolerated. All to give it to you. Society has become a part of the social gospel crowd where Christ isn't preached. And I'd rather you be offended, my friend, by the truth and avoid hell than for you to end up in hell because no one told you the truth lest you got offended. You do realize the Bible says that without Christ you are condemned already. My friend, without Christ, you are an offense to the gospel. Now, if you do not receive this in love, then you are not receiving it from my heart today. And I want to ask you a question. You tell me which is more offensive. Knowing the truth that could have saved someone's life and withholding it, By the way, which is you condemning them? Due to fear of being offensive? Or telling the truth and then they choose on their own accord not to accept the truth? That's self-condemnation. My friend, what will it be for the church? Us condemning them? Or self-condemnation. The lost person will be wondering and asking. Why didn't someone tell me or say something? When they stand before God. And where every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess. That he is Lord. All eyes will be open and all knowledge will be given on that day. And those who are that without Christ will no doubt run through the uh, uh, courts of their mind. 
in the recesses of their memory. And it may be your name that comes across of it. Why didn't you tell me? Well, I want to say that we love you and we respect you enough at Freedom to tell you the truth. We do. Jesus did the same thing, by the way. Jesus speaks so powerfully about the truth, as a matter of fact. And he spoke so powerfully in the Gospel of John about those that profess with their mouths, but their belief in the truth and their walk doesn't match. I want you to notice what Jesus says. So we're not going to come back to Genesis because my time is up. I want you to go to John chapter 8. Look at John chapter 8, and I want you to look at verse 32 through 47. My friend, this is nothing close to a social gospel. This is nothing close to an ecumenical, sensational church here. Not by Jesus' standards. And notice John chapter 8. Would you look at verse 32? The Bible says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him. Notice their response. We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man's How sayest thou ye shall be made free? What a haughty statement here. Notice Jesus' response because he always has one. Even if it's silence, he always has one. Jesus chooses to answer them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, I'm going to repeat it, you shall be free indeed. The freedom comes from the son. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but hold it, here comes the punchline. But ye seek to kill me. By the way, because my word hath no place in you. But he's not done. I speak that which I have seen, have I seen with my father. And ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Here is the comeback. In case you didn't get it the first time, Jesus, Abraham is our father. Notice, Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Mm hmm. If you really belong to the righteous, you would live righteous. God's getting right to it. Notice, but see, he said, You do the deeds of your father. That's verse 41. But verse 40 says, But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. 
this did not Abraham. Hmm. You said that you belong to Abraham. I'm sorry, I don't find Abraham doing what you're doing. Because faith was accounted to righteous. Uh, uh, faith was accounted to Abraham for his righteousness. So was Noah. But I'm going to be honest with you, Jesus says, um, I don't see that in you at all. Notice verse 41. Ye do the deeds of your father, in case you didn't hear me the first time. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Wait a minute! Now you want to change. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came forth from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Have you not heard what I've said? My friend, if you think that's three points in a poem, if you think that's some anecdotal message, if you think that this is some soft and something sweet, like your sweet and low saccharine messages, you don't know the Jesus of this book. Notice verse 44. Because Jesus is not done. Year of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and bode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it I, and because I tell you the truth you believe me not which of you convince me of sin and if I say the truth why do you not believe me He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I wonder, are you in the boat or not in the boat? The majority of creation didn't get in the boat and God judged them only eight people you don't have 120 years to hear the message the Bible says today is the day of salvation you may not have 120 minutes You may not have 120 seconds. I don't know. That's not for me to say. But I know this. The Bible says that life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then quickly vanishes away. And that our life is like grass that withereth. Like a flower that fadeth. But the word of God is for ever settled in the heavens this is your ark this is our ark Noah walked with God men ladies child teenager you that are watching or listening if you've hung in there this long Noah walked with God but he also witnessed to others. And he did it through his conduct. Maybe, Christian, you have forgotten that there's an expectation of you after you've gotten saved. And that is that if you are a Christian, that word is defined as a Christ follower. It's not that you are perfect. 
but that you strive to live as Christ has called you to live. That doesn't mean that every day is a mountain. I'm sure you have valleys because we all have them. This is not an erasing of your past. I wish that was true, but it's not absolutely not plausible. But I do know this. You define right now the meaning of it. And every one of you, God has given you something. He's given you gift. He's given you giftings. If you are a believer, he's given you spiritual gifts that he absolutely desires that you use within the body of Christ and with his community and for the world. But I'm going to tell you, those who do not witness to others, hold on to it, generally and most often comes because they are not walking with God. The greatest legacy this man had was that he got his family in the boat. I didn't begin to tell you about that. I didn't begin to tell you how he got him there. Because time is gone. But there should be enough conviction from the Holy Spirit in you if you are absolutely open to it. And yield it today. Yielded to it today. But does my walk match to the belief system that I have professed to have? It's just not truth. Because none of you would say that you wouldn't agree with anything I've said today unless you are an atheist or you aren't saved. All of you would agree with all of this, but here's the thing. Are you living based on truth? Or are you living your life based on what you truly believe? Because belief determines behavior. Belief is what leads to action. There are a lot of things I believe, and there are other things outside this Bible that are believable or truth, excuse me, that are truth. But see, God has called us to live our life based on what we believe. Jesus says, I told you the truth. And you believe them not. So you have the truth. You have the truth and you go back to Abraham. Well, no wonder it's a failure for you. No wonder it's an epic fail. Because you aren't living to the right conduct. You're living to a man's system. Instead of to Christ. Instead of to me. What he doesn't realize that he was talking, they were talking to whom shall I say sent me? You tell him, I am sent you. The very one that Abraham asked about. I am. He's the great I am. He's the father of Abraham. And yet they would not hear. Folks, our conduct should lead to change. And when we no longer see change in the church, and when we no longer see change in the community, and when we no longer see change in the world, it is directly linked to the fact that the church is not living in conduct that is conducive to holiness. Remember the song that we used to sing? We haven't sung it in a long time. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness, holiness 
is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. So take my and take my mind, conform it, take my will, transform it to the church, to the religion, to the denomination, oh Lord. That's not what it says. To you. Maybe today just needs to be a realigning of your focus to the Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed. To you, O oh Lord, to you. It's what you want from us. And it's most definitely what we need. But Lord, may it be what we want today for ourselves. So God, help every individual to recognize clearly from you what it is in them that you would have for them to change. It may have nothing to do with my message today or the message that I gave them from the Word of God. This may be something that you've been speaking to them about through their devotion or just impressing upon their heart that they had on their heart long before they ever came to this building. God, it's not for me to fashion how you're at work. I just believe and trust that you are at work. And what our response should be would absolutely be to yield to you. How would you have us to respond today? So God, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't know every need here because I'm not God, but I do know this. With the amount of people here, if only one...